funny. Now, you can imagine not very many 14-year-olds or 17-year-olds, for that matter, have a lot of money to be able to kick into a pot to travel overseas. And we are just thrilled that they would have been willing to take up such a bold risk to go overseas and do this. And so can we as a church get around this idea of supporting them? Basically, I, I, unless you have something super, super pressing, please consider heading down there and, and serving them through eating their pancakes, getting to know them, and then giving a free will offering or donation, okay? And some of you may need, if you're like me and you don't carry cash, go to the ATM, then come back and get some pancakes, okay? And it is just awesome to see what God's doing through that. Um, and so, yeah, make sure that's a priority for, priority for us, okay? Well, today, um, we're continuing. This is our second week in the series of Genesis. And, and so we're getting into the idea of creation. And so last week we talked about how man created the earth and all the stuff in the earth. And then this week we're totally focusing on the fact that God created you and me and Adam and Eve and all the people. Today is people um, creation day. And um, before we get into that, I want to talk to you about my fishing net. So I like to fly fish. Do we got any fly fishers in here, fishermen? I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at you right now so I can invite you to go fishing later. Um, I love to fly fish. As you can see, I have an overinflated fly fishing ego thinking that I could catch a fish that possibly could fit in this net, you know? And, but this is actually a net that I created. And this week I've been thinking a lot about created things. And so I had the desire to make a net that would fit or meet all of my needs. And so I decided to create this net. And I got the, the plans online and I started building it. Now, as you can imagine, every little piece of why I built this net is for a reason. And, and maybe, could we just zoom in on this puppy? This thing is good. Let me just brag for a second. This thing is awesome. But I, I created it with three, or actually four different kinds of woods. And these wood are, woods are specifically hardened, and I used a glue that would really, it's called Gorilla Glue, that would really stand up to the toughest of pressure. I, I made this net strong so that as I catch my 40-pound trout, <laughs> that it'll hold it. I'm not going to catch a 40-pound trout. Maybe. Um, I doubt it. I, I created it thin enough that it would be light, yet sturdy enough that I won't break it as I catch, you know, 50 plus fish every time I go. And these are jokes, people. Like, I, I, don't, catch, I don't catch anything hardly ever. Um, I've got laminate, like seven coats of laminate on this so that the water doesn't get into the wood and, and rot it and make it fall apart before it's needed. Right? Everything about this was created for a reason. And that's how we create things, right? We don't just randomly put a bunch of wood together and hope that it kind of ends up with something, right, in the end. I mean, I was thinking about this. This could have been a good guitar, you know, and, or a baseball bat or a big bubble blower, you know. I mean, that'd be silly, right? From the beginning, I had a plan with this thing, right? And in the same way, we're not created by accident. We're really not. God created us for a purpose. He created you for a purpose. He created our students for a purpose. He, he even created somebody that is nearing the end of their life for a purpose in their life. We are created with a reason. The way we are, the reason we are the way we are is not by accident. It just didn't happen or form. And that's what we're talking about today. And so I want to take it one step further and ask you a question before we get started. Here's the question. Fill in the blank for yourself. God created me to. Fill it in for yourself. Now, some of you may need to write this down on your notes. Um, some of you may, may have a great, you know, mental ability to arrange words and think it together. But I want you to think for yourself right now. Put, put some words to it. Put some conclusions. Make it a statement. This would be cool, wouldn't it, to, to hear what everybody would say, to, to kind of listen to your neighbor and, and uh, kind of hear why we were created. So one more time, God created me to fill in the blank. 
All right, now, if any of you are like me, that was a hard exercise, right? Like, it seems like almost everybody else except for us know our purpose sometimes, right? And, and it's almost like we can wander through life knowing, am I really doing everything that God exactly created me to do? Am I doing that with boldness, with confidence, with humility? Am I just giving my life to it? And uh, when I was thinking about that this week, I, I started looking into that question. So the first thing, of course, I wrote is, God created me to be a youth pastor. It's like, yeah, that sounds good. I like the sound of that. But then I thought about it and thought, wait, I wasn't a youth pastor until I was 22. Was I like living in sin until I was 22? And then I got it. And then I was thinking about my future and I'm not near cool enough to continue to be a youth pastor for the rest of my life. I mean, ask my wife, right? And so I'll be lucky if I make another week or month as a youth pastor. And so, so I must not only be, be created to be a youth pastor, so what else? So I was thinking, okay, let's take a step back. Maybe to shepherd or encourage people. Wait, well, yeah, but what about when I don't do that? Is that, is that good enough? And so, so I started looking into it, and I realized that it's very difficult to create a purpose statement for ourselves, to know exactly why we are created the way we are. And just so you know, we're probably not going to get to the point today where we finish this series or this sermon and you're like, I know it. I got my purpose. I got my fancy little statement and I'm doing it. But my hope is that through this conversation that we start today, as we look at Genesis and why God created us, that God would give us each insight that we could each grow along the journey, that we could each push closer towards that purpose that God had created us for. And I think, it's, I think it's scalable for all people in here. Whether you're super young or super old, I think we all fit into the idea that we could better understood and more fully live in what God has created us to do, right? And the goal, here's the goal. This is what gets me excited. You ever boldly lived out who you were supposed to be? I mean, have you ever just like unashamedly felt like an intuition that God was giving you and you just went for it, even though knowing maybe them or them or somebody was going to criticize you, but you knew that was what you were created to do? And isn't that what we all want? That we could boldly live as the person, as the human being that he has created in Grand Junction to live for who he wanted us to be, right? That's what we want. And so that's my hope, that as we talk through this, work through it, that God would just push us more, that he would make us more bold in who we are, and that we would have a church full of people that are like radically pushing for and going for what God has for them, okay? So that's where we're going. And here's kind of the statement, the main point that I'm gonna try to get across, and then we'll jump right into um, Genesis, so this is why we're going through Genesis today. That as we go through the roots of why humanity was created, we will see God's intentions for us. And when we get that, here's the purpose statement. Here's what it will be. We will find that our value drives our purpose rather than what we tend to do, which is allow our purpose to drive our value. I think the problem when we let our purpose drive our value is we live compromised, unable to completely live for the purpose that God has for us. So today, let's take this journey together. Let's all submit ourselves before God and say, God, teach me, grow me. Let me be fuller in understanding how you've given me identity and value. And let me understand more deeply what your purpose is for me. Okay, let's pray real quick and then we'll jump into that. So God, we just thank you so much for the people in this room. And uh, as I look out, I just, I, I feel your sense of um, purpose and, and value over the people that I'm looking at. That they were created for a reason, that you love them, that you knit them together specifically as who they are. And I pray that all of us, God, you would give us the blessing of allowing us to get closer to that today. And that as, as we do that, that you would put us almost like at that point of no return where we know what you're calling us to do and how to obey that and follow you. 
And so just bless us, like help us know you more today, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so for the scripture today, we're gonna focus on the text in the context of two statements. One are gonna be anytime it talks about our value, and the, the second is anytime it talks about our purpose, okay? And so I just want us to all look at this and see when God created us, what he says about our value and our purpose. I think you'll find with me that it's fascinating, that it actually speaks to us for today. So we're jumping in on the sixth day of creation. Last week, God created for five days. Today, he's going to do the last and most important day. So starting in 26, you can follow along the screens or if you have a Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. All right, the first value statement we see here is that God made humans. Okay, this is a really simple one, but one that we have to focus on. Uh, today, we're not going to talk about evolution and how, how Scripture is right and evolution is wrong and science and whatever else. We're just going to come together with the assertion that God created humans. So if God created humans, if he created you, kind of the analogy with the net, he didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm bored. I need some little people to walk around. Okay. And, and let's see. Let's start with a toe. Hmm. Nah, it's going to need a foot. And he did not do that. He had a plan and a forethought before it. And so if there was planning and forethought in your life, that means there's a reason that you were created. That means there's an intention. That means there was a purpose for it, that you're not here by accident. The second value statement that we see in this is that you were created in the image of the one and only God. So God exists, he created everything, and he decided that you were gonna be one of his creation that looks like him. Animals don't look like God. Mountains are beautiful, don't look like God. Fish are wonderful, they don't look like God. Humans look like God. You are in the image of God. Now this sounds like a totally normal notion to us, right? We grew up hearing this in Sunday school over and over and in church, and so we're like, yep, got it, next, check. Well, let's, let's just pause and think about it for a second. About four years ago, my wife and I had the chance to go to India uh, do we have any friends that have gone to India this in here? Anybody? India, India. Wow, we have got to go to India, church. It is a great place to visit. V bright and vibrant colors and uh, just great people. And when we, we were there, we, heard, we found out that there was a different creation story, different belief of how people were created there. So let me tell you this, and just imagine if you were born into this society. So Brahma created everybody in India. This is, this is kind of their idea that actually everybody in the world, it's called Hinduism. But essentially, they believe that we were born or people were born into different castes. And it's like classes of people that the first class, the highest class was made um, in the image of Brahman's head. And the second class was made in the image of his shoulders the third class was in the image of his legs, and the fourth was in the image of his feet. And so based on which class you fit into, basically based on which family you were born into, that was what your value was. And so if you were the high class, you were part of the head, you had every opportunity available to you in India. You could do whatever you want. These were the priests and the leaders. The shoulders were the warriors. The legs were the farmers and the merchants, right? You start to see that the lower you get down the class, the kind of less you are, right? Do you see that denotation? Actually, in America, don't we sometimes believe that? Oh, you're rich. You're valuable, Wow, you must be a great person. Oh, you're poor? Pfft. Spend time with you. You're nothing. You're not worth anything. Kind of the same idea, except for more explicit, right? So they would work it down, and then the lowest, made out of the feet, these were the servants. So they were, they existed, their value was found in serving the greater people, right? 
Well, then if you, if you actually go spend time there, there's actually another cast of people. They're called the deletes or the untouchables. And these don't even represent Brahma at all. Actually, they're all together off of the chart. They're actually believed to be lower than animals. Coincidentally, there's 250 million of these people that live in India. The same number of people that live in America total, almost. An unbelievable amount of people. And as we look and looked into and learned and got to know their stories, they believe that literally they're valuable. Their value is less than the animals that surrounded them. Can you imagine being grown up and told by your parents instead of you can achieve anything you want, being told you're nothing, you're worthless. This is punishment for your last life. You deserve what you've got. Stay here and do exactly what you're supposed to be doing, which is nothing because you're nothing. Can you imagine what that speaks to their value and their purpose? And then can you imagine a Christian worldview that comes in and says, actually, it's bogus. All of that stuff you learned was bogus, that you were created in the image of God, that he believes in you, that he loves you, that you have a purpose, and that you are just as good as anybody else. And it's not because of what you can accomplish, but it's totally because of who, in whose image you were created in. Can you imagine that? And so we actually don't relieve or realize how blessed we are to be grown, to grow up in a Christian nation where we believe inherently that we have worth, that we are created in God's image. This, however, though, is still contrary to some of the things that our culture believes. I mentioned it earlier, right? The faster you are, the better you are. The slower you are, the worse you are, right? The smarter you are, the better you are. The stupider you are, the worse you are. The more normal and pretty you look, the better you are. The more ugly and whatever you look, the worse you are, right? We have this idea that our purpose defines our value. So what we can do creates how valuable we are. When the reality that we see directly from the beginning of creation is that it's our value that de defines our purpose, that our value has already been settled, it's already been secure, and that that will decide what we do, right? A totally different thought. So as we continue, it says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Just a quick break, funny story about this. Um, Vanessa and I have the same color hair. This is my wife, so people a lot of times make fun of us because that we look like brother and sister. We've actually had somebody say like, oh, you must be really self-centered because you married somebody that looks like yourself. <laughs> Thanks. It's awesome. Um, but one day we were in a uh, theater, the theater at Grand Junction High School, and this um, usher walks up to us and he grabs us by the shoulders and he says, are you guys married? And we're like, yes, thank you. And he looks us in the eye, no joke, and he goes, be fruitful, multiply, have many offspring. <laughs> wow, really? Okay. Maybe that person is somebody in here. It's a weird experience. Um, so God continues. He says, But I have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over li every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, the first thing we see here is a value statement. It says, And God blessed them. Have you ever been blessed by someone? Ever had somebody look you in the eye and say, all of who you are, I've watched. I am proud of you. I've seen who you've become. I've seen the struggles and the victories that you have. And I just want to tell you how proud I am of you and how good you are. Have you ever had somebody do that to you? Right, when we use the term blessed, don't we kind of say, yeah, like God blesses us and God bless you and blessings. And I mean, we almost throw this word around as if it can just be kind of like, eh, blessing, bless, whatever. When I think when God blessed Adam, I just imagine him creating him and then looking him directly in the eye and saying, do you know who you are? I've seen you. I know you. I know your thoughts and intentions and it's good. I love you. Go do all that you have. Right? And that's the second piece that we see, a purpose statement. It says, so go, because I've blessed you, fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, subdue it, have dominion. 
I find it interesting that these are present tense statements. God didn't bless Adam and Eve and then say, you are now the king. Go be king and sit on your throne. He didn't give them a title. Isn't that what we want when we created our little, our, uh, I'm created for, don't we want to create a title? We love titles, don't we? Did you know that I can be a youth pastor that is really crappy? I can be a really poor follower of God as a youth pastor. Did you know that? It's true. I've done it a lot, actually. Because our, our title doesn't mean anything. And that's, what G, that's what God is saying here to Adam. Be fruitful. Fill the earth. Multiply. Subdue it. Have dominion. These are present tense statements. These are more focused on what you're doing today than what your title is that you can hide behind and say, but I'm the... Right? We are God's ambassadors. We're fulfilling his mission on behalf of him. And um, God says, it's more about how you live than what you're called. So the next thing he says is, and God saw everything he'd made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, this is interesting because if you look at the first five days, he created something like the galaxy, which is average, according to God, because he said, it's good. And then he creates the earth, and it's good. And then he creates humans. He created you, and he said, ah, now that is very good. That is it. That's our value. Okay, we're going to continue on. Now, we've just completed... Um, chapter one, we've taken a macro look at creation. Um, and now we're going to look, chapter two in Genesis is totally focused on, so what happened the day that God created Adam and Eve? And by day, I mean yom, for those of you here that were here last week, the Hebrew um, period of time. We don't know how long it was. So here's what it says. I think this is verse five. So when the when no brush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. So the land's there, but nothing is yet growing. The Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man, listen to this, to work the ground. So it's not ready yet to grow because there's no man yet there to work it. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now there's two statements in this that I want us to see. The first purpose statement. God created man to be the missing piece. This I find fascinating. That God created earth, that he got it all set up with only one missing piece. That was man to work the ground. I think I used to assume that work came after the fall, right? That Adam and Eve were just kind of chilling and, and life was good. The only work they had to do was to reach up and pick that sweet, you know, palisade pear or peach and, and eat it. And that was their life. I mean, their life was just good and that was the work they did. But we see a different account here. We see that, that God created the earth and it was all ready to go except for man to work it. With the idea, I mean, this is what it's saying. The idea is that man, when man does what he's supposed to do, that's the missing piece to creation. And that through your work, through my work, as we work, we fulfill the missing piece to get to see the whole system work. Isn't that neat? Isn't that cool that God would create something that when I put my work into it, it works good. And then beautiful flowers and trees. And I mean, that's the picture of the Garden of Eden. And, and I can see that in my own life. I love to build stuff, create stuff, do stuff. I actually like to work. It's a weird thought. I don't like the toil of work. I don't like the fact that I have to work for a paycheck. But when I'm off, do I just sit on the couch all day like, oh, this is so great. I mean, maybe for half a day, but then I'm up, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm doing something around the house. I want to be, you know, m making my house look better and whatever. We were created to work. It's an interesting thought about our purpose. Um, this, the second thing that we see here is that man is created intimately by God. 
that when God created man, there's a totally different feel to it than the previous chapters or verses, which is like, God spoke and it was. God said and his voice made it be. And then there's this picture of God coming and getting on the ground and, and working up the dust, forming it together, forming man, and then breathing life into it. This picture of mouth to breath. I mean, he is giving himself his life to this man. Again, totally different than any of the other picture of how stuff was created. You were created for intimacy. Guys, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that means we were created to be like all lovey-dovey, like God, let's cuddle kind of thing. Girls, maybe you feel like that more. Um, but there is a certain picture of relational desire that God has for us. He wants to know us. He wants us to know him. And we get this idea that as we are close to him, the closer we are to God, the more true life we will pull out of that. That's value. Continuing. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man he formed. And out of the, the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that was pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a purpose statement in here. Man was put in the garden by design. So I, I don't know where this happened, but God created man. And then it says, and then the Lord God planted the garden in Eden. So he made it all ready for him. And then he put the man there whom he'd formed. Like, again, very direct intent. He is trying to put him there. There's a reason he is there. This is not just by chance or happenstance. It wasn't just like, you know, Adam woke up and, hey, it's a desert. Cool. Like, God put him there for a purpose. And I would just say to you, you're here for a purpose. Your life is here for a purpose. You were born in the 20th century, maybe some of you the 21st, for a purpose. You actually even exist in Grand Junction for a purpose. You were put here. You may think that it was out of your own plans or design that you made the decision, but in the end, God knew you were going to be here. He wants you here, and he has intention for you here. So continuing. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So again, this picture of he's working and he's keeping. He puts him in to make it all work. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of the tree of the garden, any, every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day, you shall surely die. There's a purpose statement in here that I think brings this whole creation to a whole. He's saying this, your purpose will ultimately be found in obeying God. So, so far, all that God has done is he's just created really cool things. And then he put Adam there and he's like, go for it, have fun. It's awesome. I created this for you. The more you enjoy this, the more you enjoy me, the more we're all happy. I mean, God's a good God. He wanted Adam to enjoy this beautiful garden. He gives him everything, and then he says, but obey me. Don't do this. But, I mean, look at it. You got all this. I mean, this is great. He even calls, eat from the tree of life. Anybody ever watched Indiana Jones? The hunt for the little cup thing that's supposed to give life, right? Don't we want that? If there was a tree that we could get life out of. That's, God creates that. I mean, he's, that's where this comes from. And, and you are built to find life and, and, and love this garden. Enjoy it. You're built for it. Have a great time. Just obey me in it. Don't, don't, don't do this. But everything else, it's great. And I think these two trees represent everything in our purpose. Hear me out. The first tree the tree of life represents submission to God's authority. So let's imagine this tree over here. Eating of that tree was like saying, God, I trust you to provide for me. I trust what you've told me to do, and I will eat out of what you've told me to do. In other words, I believe that you will provide for me as I follow what you have for me. So you are, you are why I'm created, and I will trust you as I 
eat and follow your plan. So this is submission. This is saying, God, it's not what I want. It's not me that's going to create life for me. It's you, and I'm going to eat from that tree. The other side, this is the tree that I would say, it's the tree of understanding. It's the tree that is choosing our own wisdom.